Um, thank you all for joining us today um, for this topic, fundraising in an uncertain environment, which I know is interesting to a lot of people on the call. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sapna Shah. I'm an angel investor. I'm the founder of Retail Life Series, which used to be an in-person event series. We've now moved virtual, obviously, so we're doing these sessions every Thursday at one o'clock. Um, I also have a podcast called Retail Life Series. You can find it wherever you normally listen to podcasts if you want to hear um, founders and funders that I've interviewed on a variety of topics um, in the past. Um, and there are also some more resources um, and some community and some groups that we'll talk about at the end that you will all be invited to if you haven't been already. This session is being recorded um, and then you can find it later if you have to drop off or whatever on the RetailX website. Um, we will be having kind of a conversation uh, between myself and Namdi Okike from 645 Ventures for about the first half, and then there'll be time for your questions. You can put your questions into the chat and we'll get them, uh, we'll get to them in the end. And um, now I want to turn it over to Namdi. Could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Sabna. Um, really excited to be speaking to you guys today about uh, fundraising in this environment. Uh, so co-founder of 645 Ventures. We're a seed stage venture fund in New York. Um, we're currently investing our second fund, which is the $41 million fund. Uh, we've been around now about six years. Uh, before co-founding the firm, I spent about nine years at Insight Venture Partners, which some of you may know, which is a large multi-stage uh, New York venture fund. Uh, I did uh, close to 20 deals at Insight. I had nine exits there. Um, uh, four IPOs, five M&As, uh, primarily in enterprise SaaS, uh, also enterprise infrastructure software. Uh, so learned the venture business at Insight, uh, spent a uh, great deal of time there, and then co-founded my firm with my partner, Aaron Holiday. Uh, we do seed, primarily seed. We also do some Series A, uh, focusing on software companies. Uh, so enterprise SaaS, enterprise infrastructure. We also do select consumer companies, so online marketplaces as an example. So I can talk a little bit about some of the trends we're seeing in consumer as well. Um, we generally uh, lead seed rounds. Uh, we can also participate in series A rounds. Um, and, and one unique aspect of our model is it's very data driven. So we have our own proprietary software and analytics that we use throughout our operation to help us source, um, to help us evaluate companies, also to help our companies post investment. Uh, and in this environment in particular, we're continuing to do a lot of outbound sourcing uh, due to the fact that there's not as much network uh, driven deal flow. So I can talk a bit about kind of that aspect of our firm as well. Uh, but that's really the background um, on, on what we do and uh, very excited to um, chat about um, some of the things we're seeing in the market today. Great. Thank you. That was a great intro. Um, I want to start off with like the biggest question that's on everyone's minds. If you're a founder right now and you're fundraising, are investors investing right now? And by right now, I mean like now, but also like in the coming weeks and months. What's your take yeah. on that? Yeah, definitely. So I think there's, there's good news and bad news. Maybe I'll start with, with the bad news and then get into some of the things that are maybe more upbeat or optimistic. Um, I think due to the unprecedented nature of the coronavirus um, in terms of how it's forced people to change behavior um, and also the fact that it's kind of really shaken uh, public markets um, and, and in turn private markets, because the private markets oftentimes move um, um, in turn, they usually move more, move more gradually than public markets, but they, they definitely follow what happens in terms of the public markets, especially in terms of valuations and multiples. I think a lot of those factors have caused investors to be a lot more cautious. And what I mean by that is both in terms of where they're investing. So if you think about, um, consumer investing as an example, a lot of the behaviors uh, that may have been enabled by the last wave of companies, uh, whether it be uh, Uber and Lyft or whether it be Airbnb or whether it be a lot of the um, you know, kind of in-person driven uh, companies, a lot of those behaviors just aren't happening right now or they're happening at much, much lower volumes than they've happened historically. Uh, not to mention a lot of the technology companies selling into specific categories uh, those companies are having real challenges. So you might have seen as examples over the past couple of weeks, you know, Toast, which is a very high flying company in the restaurant tech market, you know, unicorn uh, business had to lay off, you know, 50% of its workforce as an example, because they sell POS software for restaurants, but people aren't in the restaurants. So there's not a lot of utility for a POS system, for example. 
Um, so there's been a lot of behavioral change, and I think that's driving investors to really think through what are some of the categories that are advantaged over the long term, and where what are smart places to put capital. I think the other the other uh, difference, and this is more structurally in terms of how venture investors operate, is because you know you can't meet with founders in person because it's harder to get to know founders. Um, you know, due to that kind of the normal um, forms of interaction, which aren't possible. I think that's also led some investors to be, uh, to not do new deals in this period of time, especially, um, you know, especially firms that are really focused are on kind of more network driven um, models. And so those are, that's kind of the bad news, I would say, a combination of, um, you know, structural factors, macroeconomics factors, and then, um, you know, just the nature of how venture funds do their, do their work. Now, I do think there are some um, bright spots and, and some server linings. Um, there are, so the, the server linings I would say are, one, there are certain categories that are um, uh, basically enabled or kind of advantaged in this time. So as examples, you know, our portfolio today, one of the deals we did at the end of last year was a business called lunchbox.io, which is a software company that drives um, online delivery for restaurants, but also kind of drives more revenue back to the restaurant and away from third party aggregators like Grubhub and, and DoorDash and Uber Eats, they're doing extremely well because there's, um, you know, a lot of growth for, for a lot of demand for online delivery. And these restaurants are looking for revenue streams to really support themselves. And Lunchbox is an enabler for that. Or another one of our companies, Eden Health, which is in the telehealth um, business, specifically providing on-demand primary care for employers. They, they're in really high demand um, by employers in terms of employers needing, for example, COVID testing and needing specific services now more than, more than ever for their employees who need to still kind of go into work every day. Um, they're kind of enabling, enabling those types of um, behaviors. So, so long story short, there are like some areas where you're seeing growth and there, those are definitely ones where um, investors are looking to invest. Um, and so some, some firms are willing to deploy capital into those categories, even without necessarily meeting founders. But I would say like on a kind of net basis in terms of what's happening, I think you are seeing, you know, meaningfully less investment happening, definitely in our segment of the market, this, the seed, seed and kind of early, early stage market. I mean, I think that's a helpful perspective, but my question, I guess, is for those companies that don't fit the current yeah. sort of COVID model, right? So like, let's say I'm a dress shoe company, right? Yep. Um, for go to work shoes. Yeah. Um, and I need to fundraise and I was planning on fundraising right now. And at some point people will go back to work. I think we just don't know when that is, you know, is, does it make sense for those founders in your opinion who might be raising seed right now or yeah. wanting to raise seed, should they even bother or should they wait? That's a really good question. Um, so I would suggest a couple of things. So I would never tell a founder not to go and try to raise capital because if you have a great idea, especially a great idea that's advantaged over the long term, because I do think some of these changes in behavior are not permanent, right? I mean, one thing we try to think a lot about in our investment framework is what's the long term normal? You know, what behaviors are definitely going to come back and when will those come back and, and what's just more a near term, um, a near term uh, result versus a long term result. So, if you think about your example of a, um, you know, say a shoe, a shoe company or a physical kind of, um, you know, consumer business that is, you know, selling into a category that maybe in the near term folks aren't necessarily buying a lot of, but over the long term they may be. I still think that's a viable, you know, investment proposition for a fund or for an angel investor. Um, you may be, you may have to be more creative in terms of how you present it, especially in the near term, given that investors are oftentimes looking for early traction. Um, but you know, those types of purchases, you know, will, will happen. And one thing we think a lot about is, you know, um, whether a provider is a, a luxury provider or whether a, a provider is more, um, you know, kind of a, a company that may not be, um, super high end. So I'll give you a couple of examples in our portfolio to kind of describe it. So, you know, we're investors as an example in a business called Resident. Uh, it's a cons direct to consumer company that provides uh, mattresses, all different types of furniture. We thought they were going to be really hard hit um, in this period because we said, oh, we don't think necessarily people are going to be buying, uh, you know, furniture or mattresses for their homes. But one thing we found is because they're kind of a budget provider and because 
individuals aren't able to go into physical retail stores um, to buy mattresses like they, they are people are actually buying online and they're actually looking to save money when they when, when they make those purchases so you know that company had i think their best um month uh last month in terms of revenue just as one example so so there are definitely definitely areas that may be a little bit, a bit contrarian um that may not be so apparent but long story short like regardless of what type of company you are even if you're in a category that's maybe negatively impacted even over a longer period of time, I, I would never say not don't raise capital. I, I would just more say, really think through the value proposition that you're trying to articulate, and and really think through the types of investors who may who that may appeal to. I mean, there's there's a lot of different investors who have different perspectives, so to speak, on what the long term behavioral changes may be or, or may may what things may happen. Um, no nobody really knows, so so to speak, kind of how long it may take. For um, for certain types of behaviors to come back, or whether certain behaviors will come back in even greater numbers or greater quantities, right? One thing I think a lot about is um, if you think about the e-commerce market as a percentage of total retail, it's still only about fifteen percent of the total market. Um, it's been growing gradually, but it's only fifteen percent of total retail. Um, so if you think about kind of different online businesses, um, you know, I continue to believe that the growth will will even accelerate. Um, in terms of in terms of kind of online retail, in terms of physical retail, if you're building like a physical retail company um, or retail store or something like that, again, I, it, it's hard to say not to raise capital there, but I do feel like there are some behavioral changes that may take a while to kind of sort themselves out. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that your portfolio company resident. Um, I've also seen and talked to some investors and, and even founders who are actually talking about businesses less about COVID and some behavior change, but more about recession, right? Are your business mm -hmm. recession, yeah. like, are you a budget provider or will people trade down to this business versus something like you mentioned in luxury where, you know, how many people are really going to be trading up when, to, yeah. you know, unemployment number was, is now 30 million, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, unemployment claims. So I think there's, it's more than just the COVID piece, right? It's also kind of what happens in a recession and how long does that recession last? Yeah, that's a really good point. Definitely. Um, you know, if you look at some of the job numbers, unemployment numbers, they're just really, you know, kind of sad to see. And if you think about the livelihood of so many people who have lost their jobs or, you know, um, who have, you know, whose businesses may be going out of business, I mean, all different types of companies around the country, it's, it's really, um, it's really, it's really sad and it's very tough. And I do feel like what you're likely to see is that, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of purchasing, you know, consumer purchasing in terms of categories consumers purchase in, there may be a shift definitely to more budget categories, kind of categories where people are looking to save money, which is what you've seen historically in downturns. Now, I, hes I hesitate to compare this period to, for example, the last recession, because I think there's some fundamental differences. And I think this is a deeper recession that impacts a lot more segments of the market, so to speak, than what you saw there. So it's hard to make direct comparisons, for example, the 2008, 2009. But what you did see in that period is that there were certain companies that kind of evolved to capitalize, so to speak, on people's changes in, in purchasing. So, you know, the classic example is Airbnb, which everybody cites around this idea around kind of the sharing economy and people wanting to move, uh, shift over to um, staying in kind of shared spaces versus staying in hotels, as an example. And on the supplier side, people were looking for alternative income. And that was actually a great place for people to start to kind of generate an income. So there were different things that drove the growth of Airbnb. But they're all different types of examples of companies that are kind of enabled um, by those changing kind of um, uh, changing uh, structural uh, characteristics of society. And so if you're, if you're a founder who's thinking about a company to start or like, you know, just ideating, so to speak, I would definitely recommend like just kind of starting to play out in your mind, like what, what behaviors do you think are kind of long-term behaviors and are there certain call it kind of cost savings or budget um, categories that you believe will, um, you know, either evolve or, or may kind of come back. Um, so yeah, definitely. I think, I think, I think thinking through the economic impacts and kind of how it impacts the average person, I think is a, is a, is a great framework. Yeah, and, and you you just said something which I was going to get to later, but we're just going to move there right now. Mm -hmm. um, which is that like if you're in the ideation mode, it's a great time to think about 
kind of yeah. those things. But if you have sort of an existing business that you're working on and, and you know, maybe you're raising pre-seed or seed right now and, you know, you haven't gotten that far, but you've gotten yeah. some traction. Is it worth thinking about those trends in your mind if your business doesn't apply to today, right? It's either store-based or workwear-based, yeah. you know, something like travel, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, is it worth thinking about pivoting now? Would you, you know, what advice would you give to founders? You know, should they pivot given the new environment? Should they stick to their guns? Uh, yeah, that's a, really, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, man, so I think it really comes down to, again, how much you believe in your current business and business model and whether you're willing to stay the course over the long term. So what I mean by that is, you know, if you're building, if you're a founder and you want to build, founders have all kinds of different you know, motivations, right, to begin with, right? C certain founders want to build more of a lifestyle business. Certain founders want to build a very, very large company. And, and founders have different timeframes as well. But if you're a founder who is looking at the long term and you want to build a business that's built to last and that can get to, you know, large scale, however you define that, I think what you really want to think through is, is your current business focus and business model one that has long term viability? And if you do think it has long-term viability, and you, if you, even if it's in a category that's kind of near-term near -term disadvantaged or where it's harder to raise capital in the near term, if you believe in the long-term value proposition and you be, believe that the type of product or service that you're selling is one that's going to be in high demand, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend per se pivoting because I believe, you know, I always think about the long-term. And I think you should look at that as a founder too, because the other thing is if you're in an area that you believe in the short term is not necessarily advantage. One benefit you have is that you're not going to have a lot of competition. So one thing we always think about is structural competitive advantages you can kind of put in place in your company. And one thing that's interesting is in that in difficult periods, it attracts less people. And it just by nature of the, the difficulties, it attracts less, less people that want to start there. And you can actually put up some very, very interesting, your barriers to entry in those types of markets. And those could be brand advantages, those could be um, technology advantages, uh, those could be some kind of network effect. There's all kinds of different examples of companies that have kind of like really been, um, you know, kind of like enabled in tough times and kind of came out of it, you know, um, you know much, more, much more strongly. So, so I would say like that would be one approach. In, now, if you don't believe in the long-term viability of your company or your category, and you believe that you're kind of in a category where, or, or your business model is not, is not in an area where you think there's long-term viability or where you really question the long-term viability, in that case, I would probably think through a pivot. Now, that could be, there are different types of pivots, right? I mean, there's pivots around um, the type of customer. There's pivots around the distribution model. Um, there are pivots around pricing. There's all different ways you can kind of pivot a company, um, you know, I'll give you one example. So I was talking to a founder, um, two founders actually, um, a couple weeks ago, they're currently um, at Penn and they have a business effectively uh, that's dependent upon uh, physical vending machines. Effectively, it's a, uh, it's a way for brands to kind of get their product to end consumers and they, they effectively use vending machines to do that. And so they were saying, okay, like, should we stick with this vending machine approach um, given that people aren't necessarily going to vending machines right now, or should we pivot to a different type of distribution, online distribution, or another type of distribution? And my advice was like, look, you know, I don't necessarily think over the long term that, you know, people won't use vending machines. I think they will, definitely. Um, I think at some point people will, you know, and go back to physical spaces and, and they'll be using vending machines. But if you, if you believe that the long-term viability of the business um, is not necessarily depending upon the vending machine model. And you think there's an, another model that may be better and maybe more viable Then sure. Like, you know, maybe pivot over to a different type, different type of distribution for your product. So that's, that's kind of the framework that I would suggest. Um, but again, any, any type of pivot that you make, I just always think it should be one where you really have a long-term belief in it. Like one, one, one challenge we have is with companies where there's a constant pivot that doesn't really have a lot of structure to it um, or, where you know a lot of the assumptions really aren't really tested out, you know, because when you pivot a company, I mean, that's a big undertaking, you know. I mean, it's 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 big in a lot of different senses. You may have to do away with a current revenue stream, you know. So so I would just kind of be cautious about that. That's a great lens to look at it through. It's kind of this long term viability lens, and um, I'm going to steal that from you until. Um, <laughs> sure. Go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so getting back to kind of fundraising for a moment. Um, yeah. 
What do you think is going to happen to valuations? I've seen some surveys of VCs on Twitter and LinkedIn that say, you know, the average, the average is kind of people think valuations are coming down like 30% at the early stages, mm. maybe by the end of the year, maybe now, maybe for the long term. Kind of, where do you fall out on that kind of spectrum? Yeah, definitely. Um, I do think valuations will go down across the board. Um, it's hard for me to say exactly what percentage per se, but let me, I, I might just step back and describe a little bit around how we think about valuations in the context of supply and demand. And maybe just to explain to entrepreneurs, like some of the, some of the, the impacts of kind of how valuations are driven, right? So when we think about capital markets, we always think about supply of capital and demand for capital, right? If you think about the early stage for founders, the supply of capital is coming from a couple of different types of groups angel investors, accelerators, um, you know, classical seed funds and early stage funds, right? And the supply is usually driven by a couple of different uh, sources. So angel investors, that's you know, high net worth individuals, folks who have additional income or wealth to invest in companies, right? In this period, a lot of folks um, are ne aren't necessarily as wealthy as they used to be, and they may not be having as much discretionary income to put into early stage startups. And so for that reason, in terms of the supply of angel capital, my guess is that will, that will drop potentially meaningfully um, over the next six to 12 months in terms of the number of folks that are actively making angel investments, right? If you think about uh, venture investors, um, our capital comes from institutional investors, typically, not always. I mean, you have also have individual investors who put capital into funds. We have some in individuals in our fund as well. But predominantly, uh, venture uh, capital, in terms of its supply, is coming from endowments, uh, pension funds, um, to different types of institutions, all of which um, are having certain impacts due to these changes in, 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 in society. Everything from universities, you know, who have had to cancel classes or may, have, may be having to delay their next terms. They don't have as much revenue coming in from students, as an example. You have institutions that may have a lot of money in public markets, may have a lot of money in areas that have been impacted. They may not have as much money to put into venture and alternative assets. All those things effectively result in a smaller amount of supply um, of, of capital. Now, when there's less supply of capital, it's kind of, I think about it as a market, if there's, if there's less supply of capital, then you know, value, competition for valuations comes down. If you think about the last couple of years, especially in the seed market, there was a proliferation of funds, uh, investors, there was more seed funds getting started than ever, um, and more money coming into the seed market, which pushed up prices. You know, if you think about the average seed round valuation over the past couple of years, I think it more, more than doubled. I remember talking to, uh, we talked to Howard Morgan, who's one of our LPs from First Round, um, one of the first seed funds. And he said, wow, you know, when we first started investing in seed companies, you know, we were investing in companies at, you know, uh, three or four million dollar uh, pre-money valuations. And now we'd be lucky, this was maybe a year or two ago, we'd be lucky to get into a company for, say, less than a $10 million pre, right? So very meaningful growth in valuations for, in the seed market uh, over the past couple of years. I, I do believe that that trend will reverse because if you think about the amount of capital and the supply of capital, and not just at the early stage, but really across the board, uh, growth stage, even late stage, that supply will, will drop. Now, there, the, the silver line I think for founders is that you did have a lot of funds that raised funds over the past few years. So those folks that have raised funds, they have to deploy that money, right? They can't hold on to it indefinitely because their LPs you know, have timelines and they need to put the money to work. So that's kind of a countervailing factor. The fact that you have a lot of funds with a lot of money to invest and they can't sit on the sidelines forever. It, even if some of them may not be investing in the next quarter, they're gonna have to deploy the capital. So that in a sense like mitigates some of what I'm describing in terms of the supply reduction. But I do believe kind of, again, on a net basis over the long term, you will see a drop in valuations. I don't, it's hard to say how much that's going to be. I think like anecdotally, what we've seen so far as a seed investor is that, you know, um, on average, we're probably seeing maybe somewhere in the range of 10 to 15% drop, but we do see like some outliers, right? We see certain founders who may be very high demand founders, maybe, you know, uh, previous successful founders, et cetera, who are still trying to raise that pretty high numbers uh, in, for their seed rounds or even their series A rounds. So we do see some of those. And on the flip side, we see some companies that are raising at very low prices where, you know, you might just say, hey, you're gonna take too much dilution at the seed. But I would say, I would say overall, you are, you are seeing a drop. And I think you will see that continue because again, these markets are, are cyclical. Like, you know, 
the supply and demand, you know, kind of move cyclically and um, that impacts valuations. And I think that will always be the case. I just think this period is kind of an extreme period for all the reasons we've described. Yeah, and I, th I think it's, um, I, just to your point about angel investors, I think that is what I'm hearing a lot from angels as well, that you have angels, I think there were a lot of, I don't, and I don't mean this in a bad way, like angels who are just dabblers, right? Yeah. Who were kind of like, startups are really hot right now, it's really cool, it's really trendy, yeah. it's gonna sort of invest um, here and there or in things that you know my buddy shows me or whatever. Yeah. And I think those kind of high net worth individuals who had been sort of dabbling, we're going to see pull back quite a yeah, bit. Yeah, I, um, I agree. And, you know, and I think so the, the pool of angel investors of people like myself who are kind of in this for the long haul. Yeah, definitely. Um, will, will still be investing. Yeah. But really, I can't make up for all those people who are going out of the market and the angel yeah. investors right now. Yeah, I completely agreed. Um, you know, I think and it's the same thing in venture, right? I mean, investors you might call tourist investors who are there for a period of time and 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 they kind of add capital and supply to the market which is great for founders again because they're more alternatives but um, at the end of the day you know the way we always think about early stage is it's it's a very long-term game um, and it may take a company eight years or ten years or even you know more than that to get to eventual exit and I do feel like investors who who don't have that time frame may say wow you know like why would I do angel investing? Not to mention the other thing is we, we kind of feel like this, you know, there, 2019 was a great year for exits. There was a lot of IPOs. Um, you know, I think it actually might've been the largest um, year uh, historically in terms of volume or, or kind of size of exit value in the technology markets. The, the fact that, that those windows will at least close uh, for a period of time also impacts investors because it takes longer to get to liquidity. And you'd actually seen, so what's interesting over the past couple of years, you'd seen this interesting dynamic in terms of more capital coming into the market, but because there was so much late stage capital coming into the market, time to exit was longer for a lot of startups. I mean, you saw companies, I mean, Airbnb is a perfect example, or, you know, Uber, you know, Lyft, they took a long period of time. Airbnb is still not uh, exited. Um, it took a longer time for those companies to get, get out. But when they did, they got out at lar much larger numbers than historically was, was happening. Now, I think what you'll see is, an elongation even, even further for companies in terms of getting to exit, um, just due to the nature of kind of how the public markets have, have reacted to what's happened. So, you know, if you're a founder, again, thinking about early stage capital, I think the bright spots, there are a couple of bright spots. I think, I think one bright spot is the investors who kind of stay in the market, in a sense, they've already kind of been filtered, you know, in a sense, like you're actually getting investors who want to invest in your company for the long term and, you know, have probably a dedication to really supporting you and will be able to follow on and really provide, you know, good support. So although there may be less total capital, the capital that's there may be actually uh, better capital, smarter capital than uh, you might have seen uh, a year ago or two years ago, which is which is probably a silver lining, I think, for founders in a sense. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there are some good news and some bad news, but I think again, as founders, um, you know, you, there's still a lot of great investors in the market. And, you know, um, we think a lot about in terms of valuation, just my last point on this is we want to make sure we're giving companies a fair price because we look at this as a very long-term business. And what we, what we don't want to do is lowball a founder, um, one, because it's just not good business practice, but also because we're aiming to invest in this founder for a long period of time. And we don't want the founders to say, Hey, like, you know, six, four, five gave us a really raw deal. And we don't want them to come into our series a or follow on, not to mention, we always want to have a great reputation in the market. So we just think a lot about kind of like what's, what's fair value for a business. You know, we will look at comps. We will look at a lot of different things to try to just make sure we're coming in at a price where we can uh, get a good return for our fund. But, we definitely don't want to be taking advantage of founders in this period and, uh, you know, providing kind of really low prices. Fair, really fair. Thank you for sharing that. I have one more question before we move to some of the Q and A from the audience, which is, and you a little bit alluded to this, that, you know, if you're fundraising now or probably anytime soon, you're going to be doing a lot of virtual pitching yeah. uh, and not meeting yeah. You know, investors in person. So do you have any tips for how to build those relationships virtually where you can't meet in person and really get to know someone? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I'm just thinking through um, kind of do maybe do's and don'ts for founders. Right. So 
the, the virtual environment, I think, is an interesting one because it does provide, it does level the playing field in certain senses for founders, uh, but it does provide some additional challenges. So I think the way that it levels the playing field is that one, it reduces um, the, uh, it redu reduce, reduces kind of the relationship based or kind of referral based or kind of um, what I might call uh, making it very difficult to kind of get to an investor. What, what I mean by that is I think, you know, if you think about how investors source um, and how um, investors find deals, oftentimes it's referral based, oftentimes it's, you know, in places where not all founders can kind of, can kind of get to. And I think this environment now um, uh, in some cases may require uh, funds to kind of look outbound, to look for founders in places they may not have looked before, to start tracking more data, start looking for certain things where it may level the playing field a little bit in terms of founders. Not to mention like in a, in a virtual environment, um, there are some ways I think to really put your best foot forward. We think a lot about, you know, um, you know, having a compelling demo that you can kind of show virtually to a VC to really prove, you know, if you're if you're a, a, a team that's been able to build a great product, that may shine kind of in a, in a virtual, um, you know, virtual presentation. Um, you know, there are certain things in terms of kind of, um, you, you know, kind of having compelling slide content. Um, you know, being able to kind of present in a really concise way. Those are probably commonalities. Um, you know, regardless of the type of the type of founder you are, kind of regardless of the time when you're raising. But I do, I, I would think a lot about, you know being able to make, um, be able to make your pitch very concisely and per perhaps kind of more, more, more briefly than you might in, in a, in a typical kind of in-person. I do feel like, you know, one thing, you know, for example, we're planning our, um, our, um, you know, our, our upcoming annual meeting, which is happening in June. And we we're talking to some of our LPs and they're like, look guys, you used to do kind of a half day kind of uh, in-person annual meeting. Don't do that in this environment. You know, it's hard for, to keep people's attention in the virtual setting. Um, for more than per se a couple hours. So we're reducing the amount of our content and um, you know, the, the amount of time. And I think the same thing may hold for founders. You, know, you may have been used to doing a one hour pitch, uh, so to speak, to a, to a fund and kind of sitting down and getting to know them and all of that. There may not be as much of that in, in, the, virtual, in the virtual context. Um, so, so I think there are definitely you know, some things to think about in terms of just how to present. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, if you're a founder with a strong value prop and you know a, a good business idea, maybe some early traction, I think you know you can still make a pretty compelling um, you know, argument. I think the other thing you want to think about is how to enable um, an investor to do virtual due diligence. So you know, virtual due diligence may take a couple different forms. Um, it may be, for example, doing you know uh, reference calls with you know, customers. We're still doing that, you know, for deals we're looking at. It's, we can definitely do that, you know, do those. We've always done those virtually um, as examples or, um, you know, they, they may be doing more of their work, um, you know, kind of virtually um, and just kind of enabling, you know, investors to be able to do that, you know, creating a data room, for example, you know, doing certain things just to kind of like have your ducks in a row. So, you know, investors can kind of really get up to speed on your company, um, you know, quickly. I think those are all, are all positive, um, you know, positive things to do. Um, but again, it is, a, it is a more challenging environment, but at the end of the day, I do think kind of good founders can pull it off and, um, you know, you just have to kind of be creative and thoughtful about it. Yeah, I think those are all great pieces of advice. I especially like the idea of getting all your ducks in a row, which frankly you should have been doing anyway, even with yeah. you know, meetings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah. That's good advice, just generically. Um, yeah. So, all right, so I want to move to some of the, um, Questions from the audience yeah, great. Uh, before we run out of time. Okay, the first one is from Kristen, who asks, have there been specific trends you've seen in consumer spending by geography, or how do investors think that will play out? That's a really good question, uh, Kristen. It's kind of a pretty nuanced question. Um, I'll, I'll apply, I would just I'll describe a couple of different frameworks that we're thinking through. So one of our beliefs is that, um, COVID-19 and the resulting impacts of COVID-19 kind of effectively force um, um, certain uh, consumers, also enterprises, to cross the chasm. So people are probably familiar with this kind of crossing the chasm concept around kind of how do, um, you know, how do people adopt a new technology, a new product, uh, a new service. And this concept is basically that there's early adopters uh, who typically are not the majority of people who start to adopt a product. And then eventually those early adopters evangelize, more people start to 
uh, get onto it. And then there's the early majority. And eventually, much later on, there's kind of mass market, you know, that may take multiple years to kind of, uh, to kind of get there. Um, now, if you think about this crossing the chasm concept, you can think about it in a bunch of different ways. You can think about it in terms of um, type of consumer, or you can think about it in terms of size of company, you can think about it in terms of geography. If you think about the geographic framework, one thing we think a lot about is there are certain behaviors that may have been uh, predominant or well accepted in big cities that may not have been historically adopted, widely adopted in smaller cities, right, as an example. I'll give you one example in our current portfolio, which is um, grocery delivery, right? We're investors in a company called Rosie. Rosie provides uh, software and uh, effectively a tech-enabled service to grocery stores to enable them to do online uh, delivery of groceries, right? Now, if you think about online de grocery delivery, that type of behavior has been relatively commonplace in places like New York, right? Where people have disposable income, maybe they're willing to pay the service fee, um, maybe they don't have the time to go to the grocery store. Again, I don't want to uh, stereotype, but for, for whatever reason, those type of behaviors are relatively commonplace in big cities, not as commonplace in smaller cities. So what Rosie does is it sells into grocery stores in smaller cities, um, you know, more uh, regional, uh, smaller cities, you know, more regional and kind of more rural places. Now, in the first couple of years of their business, it was really this crossing the, crossing the chasm idea in the sense of, it was harder to get grocery stores to adopt. Not, not only that, even if they got grocery stores to adopt, to get consumers to want to order online uh, and have you know, groceries delivered, that really wasn't super commonplace. Now, um, effectively, people are forced to cross the chasm and they're seeing kind of skyrocketing growth in terms of their revenue, as an example, because people want to do that and they're kind of being forced to do that. And, and so they're seeing a lot, of these, a lot of these places like really adopt their technology. And so you know, they've grown, I think, like 10x in the last... Uh, couple of months. That's, that's one example. I think there are a lot of other examples, again, where you might think about kind of this crossing the chasm um, up, approach. Now, the other thing I think a lot about, and again, I don't, want, I don't want, to, want to stereotype in any way, but you also, I think, want to think about uh, types of behaviors that, you know, may be more geared toward, um, you'd ge geared toward kind of certain, um, you know, certain kind of wealth um, you know, certain types of wealth characteristics. So we have a framework which we really like, which really a floodgate, um, floodgate Capital came up with. This is just kind of this, uh, what's called wine sipper versus beer slammer. And the concept is wine sippers are kind of, you know, uh, wealthy people who adopt certain behaviors and they have a lot of discretionary income, but those behaviors really don't get to the mass market, right? Um, either because those products are too expensive or maybe they're frivolous or, you know, the average person may not want to do those things. There's also kind of the beer slammer approach, which is, okay, you know, uh, the average person, the average household maybe really wants this product. And I think we always think about like, what are some of those kind of beer slammer type businesses? Um, and, you know, where are they playing out geographically? And I do think you want to pay pretty close attention to what some of those uh, changes um, may, may be and kind of whether they're starting to kind of proliferate maybe more quickly um, you know, throughout the country. So th those are, those are like a couple of ideas. Again, it's hard, it's hard to generalize, but I would say like, you know, you are seeing certain specific trends that seem to be like proliferating now across the country, everything from, you know, online food delivery, you know, grocery delivery as examples, you know, people looking for ability to kind of do certain things virtually where they may not have done those things in the past. And so, you know, um, I would just kind of use that, that lens. I don't know if that's helpful. That, that's really interesting. And I think um, I would almost say that there's also a, the other side of it, right? So just from now, as we look through geography, places that are less dense, um, yeah. I'm in the Hudson Valley right now, we're mm -hmm. not dense at all. Yeah. Versus in like New York City, I think we'll have very different consumer behavior. I think Definitely. people here are much more likely to go back to stores mm -hmm. uh, versus in the city where you're going to feel a little bit nervous and it's a little crowded, right? Yeah. And I, I think, think that's a great point. We'll see how that kind of pans out. I mean, we're seeing a lot of states reopening this weekend, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, but, in the, but in the lower, I think in the lower density markets, you may see completely different consumer trends than in the um, dense markets. I think you're definitely right about that. Um, I think uh, areas with less density, they, they may be, it may be easier for them to go back to some of those traditional behaviors, you know, if you think about you know, having, you know, lived in New York for a long period of time, I think a lot about, wow, a lot of the things that we took for granted in terms of like, 
you know, everything from, you know, taking the subway where there's, you're packed into the subway or you go to a, you know, a basketball game or a baseball game, or, you know, you know, all these things that you do where you just are, you know, dependent upon being, you know, in places where there's, you know, very uh, close uh, proximity to, 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 to others, those behaviors may change. Now in, in non-dense cities, like that may not be as commonplace or, you know, like there, there may not be as much behavioral change, you know? So, so I would definitely kind of think through, you know, some of those, those impacts and kind of like, if you're, one thing we think a lot about, like, if you're a startup, like, is there any way you can kind of like better enable what might be kind of a new, a new normal, you know, and, and is there a way to kind of enable people to experience certain things that they may not have been able to experience before, um, or, you know, to try to replicate some of those experiences they can't, they can't do as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess we'll kind of see how that all shakes out. Yeah. All right. Moving to the next question um, from Andrea. You mentioned companies creating unique barriers to entry, brand, tech, network. Have you seen interesting ones specifically in retail D to C? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, yes, um, there are definitely companies that have created unique experiences or kind of, you know, barriers to entry. So I would mention a few, um, and these are, um, these are just kind of ideas, right? So there was a really good uh, blog post uh, by Sarah Tavell, and I'm, the, the, I'm blanking on the, the name of it. Oh, it's called, it's called, um, oh, she, so she did one called the hierarchy of engagement where she kind of described how to think about um, companies and kind of how they engage. But she also did another one that basically talked about great marketplaces and how they kind of expand supply. And her whole concept was the best um, marketplace companies oftentimes tap into um, certain types of supply that may not have been um, available before. So, you know, I mean, there's a bunch of different examples of that. Um, everything from, you know, um, Airbnb kind of enabling, um, you know, individual hosts to be able to uh, make their homes available uh, where that wasn't the case uh, before. Um, or, um, you know, businesses like, you know, I, I think about Stitch Fix as an example of a great one where they use uh, software analytics and algorithms to better, uh, more precisely make recommendations um, to um, individuals uh, to enable kind of a more personalized uh, service, but really kind of with a strong technology backend that kind of complements the traditional personalized styling recommendation as an example. So a company selling an actual product, uh, but, you know, a company that had um, real, you know, structural innovation. I think a lot about, you know, uh, Rent the Runway um, as an example, which um, obviously is, is going through some challenges right now, but in terms of what they did from the perspective of logistics, um, being able to enable, you know, kind of a, uh, uh, a business that kind of, you know, effectively had, you know, ver very quick kind of turnover of inventory and all kinds of logistical kind of backend required that, requiring that to happen. So there's, there's been all kinds of like unique innovations um, that kind of direct consumer companies or kind of consumer oriented companies have had, we kind of usually break it into the following characteristics. One is network effects. So can you build a strong enough network either because you're the first uh, mover or because like there's something unique about your service that you know, enables you to kind of get large enough where you can block competitors out. So one category is just a network effect. The second one is proprietary technology um, that other people have trouble replicating. Um, you know, brand um, can be one. So there's a, um, there's uh, this concept of category design. Um, I don't know if anybody has heard of that concept, but this idea is around kind of the best companies, um, you know, they, they, they don't try to be, they just don't try to replicate. They try to kind of um, create a new category in this book. There's a book called Play Bigger that describes this concept of category design and how the best uh, brands are oftentimes associated with a category. So you don't think about, you don't think about the category, you think of the company itself. Um, so I think there are definitely some consumer companies that have been able to do that over the years. Um, but yeah, those are, those are some of the frameworks that we think about. Yeah. And I'll just add one that I've seen in D 2 C companies more recently, which is supply chain advantages where they have locked up some particular, um, supply chain that's really hard to replicate, um, whether it's a factory a manufacturer or an actual, you know, made to order some technology that helps supply chain, um, where it would be really hard to replicate and creates kind of a barrier to entry in terms of getting product fast enough or customized enough or something like that as well. Yeah, that's great. 
Okay, next question. Um, for context, what would you consider to be a very high cap number that an experienced slash desired founder might be able to raise up for a seed or an angel round? 10 million, question mark? <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Um, very high cap number. Um, let's see. So, um, those, so very high actually might be even higher. I mean, we have seen... Um, companies um, that may raise, I mean, you know, for example, uh, Y Combinator companies, for example, uh, may come out and, and be raising at, you know, 12 or 15, you know, million dollar caps, uh, so to speak, which um, in some cases, historically, we've even seen higher, um, you know, so those, those are pro the high end, I would probably say for like an experienced founder kind of in this environment, um, in terms of a, in terms of a cap might be something kind of in the say 12 to 15 range, but I would say like in terms of what we would want to do, and again, it depends on, um, you know, if the, if the company has traction, if it's just a concept, et cetera. But I would say practically speaking, you know, for say a first, you know, kind of pre-seed or angel round, you know, I would say like 10 would probably be the number that we would think about in terms of like what we'd be willing to do. Um, you know, it might be a little bit higher than that if it's a founder who's had a very large exit before or, or just something that's really exceptional. Um, but I would say like the, our rule of thumb generally is that like for most deals that we do, um, we would like to get, you know, 10% ownership for a uh, million dollar check. Um, that's kind of our, our rule of thumb depending upon, again, it depends upon how far the company is. And again, like generally speaking, like, you know, whatever you might've been able to get say six months ago or 12 months ago, um, you probably get a lower price than that uh, now. Um, um, not to say definitely, but likely. But yeah, I would say like, I would say 10 is probably reasonable, um, you know, in terms of like what we would do, but you know, some investors, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder, you know, um, if you're a very experienced uh, founder and you have an angel or in a fund that really likes what you're doing, likes the category, thinks it could be a billion dollar company, maybe you can, you can get more than that. Great. Thank you. And Brian, you mentioned the lack of in-person networking has investors looking in other places to find founders. Can you elaborate a little on that? Yes. Um, so I can talk about what we do um, in terms of our model and I can't speak for most investors, but I can talk about our approach. So our approach is um, what we call outbound sourcing. So outbound sourcing is, um, is kind of the inverse of uh, network driven sourcing. Now we do both. So we have deals that will come through us definitely through referrals. Uh, that could be, um, you know, uh, other funds we've worked with in the past, uh, other entrepreneurs that we've invested in, uh, university networks, you know, all kinds of different networks, right? So a lot of our deal flow will come through um, referral based or inbound. Um, however, and I would say the majority of early stage deal flow for VCs comes through that approach. Now, I think it's harder, it just, it's, it's more difficult to source that way, per se, um, especially um, the, um, the, the type of networking that is dependent upon physical interaction. On the flip side, we do a lot of outbound sourcing. And I think, you know, I do think some funds probably are doing that more. Outbound sourcing is looking for great founders and, and using uh, specific characteristics to try to find those. Um, so that could be everything from uh, tracking uh, web traffic and looking at companies whose internet traffic is growing really rapidly. Um, oftentimes that can be a signal for consumer uh, uh, growth and demand for consumer companies, as an example, um, or it could be looking at places like Product Hunt. We oftentimes will be tracking Product Hunt in terms of uh, when products launch, uh, which ones have the most uh, likes or upvotes on Product Hunt. Um, you know, we look at places like uh, you know, G2 Crowd or Captera, um, where we see uh, reviews uh, for, for software products that we might be interested in. Um, so there's all kinds of different places uh, that we look, um, not to mention, um, you know, there's all kinds of kind of, uh, you know, um, places that may be interesting for investors to start to be looking into. Um, those could be accelerators they may not have looked to in the past. You know, I know a lot of accelerators may be going virtual now, um, as an example. Um, so, so at the end of the day, like, you know, one of, our, one of our beliefs is that there's a lot of value in outbound sourcing and going to find uh, founders. One of the reason we think that is most interesting is it's kind of a level of the leveling of the playing field. Meaning when you go outbound, you know, um, you're not necessarily relying on the traditional sources and you might find a company um, or a founder who you never have gotten connected to through a warm introduction. Uh, not to mention it, it enables uh, more geographically dispersed sourcing and you can find companies in places you might not have been looking. So that's kind of how we, how we look at the world. Yeah. Again, I can't speak for most funds. I, I do think, you know, some funds may default to, Hey, like 
because we're not taking meetings now, we really want to be reliant on investing in people that we got to know, you know, before, uh, before we had to go remote. So it may, it may cause some investors just to actually do more of the previous behavior, which is just, you know, focus on founders that they knew before, but you can't, you kind of can't do that forever, you know? Um, um, you know, like you're going to have to at some point look beyond, um, you know, the folks that you've, you've known or you got introduced to previously. So I do feel like it may, it may compel investors to, um, to look a little more broadly. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question and we have one more question. So that's perfect. Um, yeah. 645 has made a few investments in healthcare slash wellness due to COVID-19. Do you expect your firm or other VCs to increase their investment in the digital B2C or B2B2C healthcare wellness space, excluding biotech? Um, so I can answer for us and then I can answer maybe a little more generally. So definitely for us, um, we definitely are looking to make more investments in healthcare uh, uh, technology. And that could be um, you know, B2C or, or B2B2C or traditional B2B. So if I think about um, companies we've invested in historically, um, you know, we're investors in a company called Eden Health. Uh, Eden Health provides on-demand um, uh, primary care for employers, and they deliver that through a telehealth model. They also deliver that through a physical clinic model. Um, they sell primarily to enterprises, so it's a B2B business. Um, but that's one that we're really excited about. Um, and I mentioned, I think at the beginning, kind of some of the things that they've been enabling um, in the current uh, pandemic in terms of COVID testing. Uh, we recently did a new deal in a business called Slope.io. Uh, Slope.io is a pretty interesting company. So this is a good example of, of a couple of things I was mentioning. So it's a company uh, that is in Richmond, Virginia, not a place that we would look normally, but you know, really good founder that we, um, that we identified and really good founding team. What Slope.io provides is software uh, for uh, effectively managing clinical trials and specifically the supply chain aspect of clinical trials, enabling, um, uh, enabling clinical trials to be run more efficiently. We believe there's going to be a lot of demand for their software over the next couple of years. Um, and so we think they're well positioned. Um, but definitely, I mean, in terms of the B2C areas that we're thinking about, um, I think there's a couple. Um, you know, we've been thinking a lot about um, uh, telehealth and specifically um, mental health. Um, we've been tracking a couple of different companies that provide virtual kind of mental health consultations. Um, you know, um, we do think that's an area that's kind of under targeted, underserved, uh, that we would love to, um, you know, uh, at some point kind of get involved in, um, as, as an, as a category. Um, we think there's all kinds of different, um, new uh new new approaches uh that may be enabled um not to mention kind of uh new needs and kind of demands um that there that there may be um one area that i've been thinking a lot about um in, in i don't know if there are founders out there that i'm thinking about it but it was specifically around supply chain uh for hospitals and in healthcare institutions one thing i think a lot of us were shocked by and really um, um you know just kind of was so disappointing was to see the fact that so many um, uh, healthcare, um, so many hospitals and kind of clinics were just dramatically under supplied in terms of equipment and in terms of uh, PPE and, and all the different things that they need to kind of address this pandemic. And I would think that like post the pandemic, we would start to really think through like, how do we better equip um, and prepare our hospitals to be able to deal with some of these things and having the right equipment? I mean, what you just saw, a lot of these supply chains completely break down um, in terms of, uh, you know, being able to get access to um, um, and access the right equipment and supplies. And there were a lot of factors that um, uh, were impacted there, but in, in at least being able to predict and be able to kind of estimate what needs might be, I think is really important. So I think there's a lot of um, opportunities there, whether it be from the data perspective, marketplace perspective, I think there's a lot of opportunities. It's just one area, but yeah, generally speaking, I think, um, I think there's a lot of opportunities. Um, and and I, again, I talked about both B2C and B2B because we do primarily B2B, but I, I would say like there are definitely a lot of interesting um, uh, B, B2C opportunities as well. Great. That is all the time we have. Namdi, thank you so much for taking your time. And, Thanks for and having me. Great advice. Thank you all to the audience for coming. Um, everybody who signed up for this session will be put on the email list for RetailX. You'll also get invites to the Google group and the Slack channel. Those are optional, but I hope you join. The next event next week is all about building remote teams. On May 14th, we're doing one on social media advertising, particularly in this time where CPCs have come down quite a bit. Um, and there are more events on the RetailX site. Um, thank you all for coming and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Navi. Bye. Thanks a lot.